Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. If you can all take your seats, thank you. Thank you for coming to the keynote event of the celebration for the 20 years of the Kokelis Foundation. At the beginning of this evening, I would like to invite the man behind the vision of the foundation, our chairman, Mr. Socrates Kokelis, to address the gathering. Mr. Kokelis. Επειδή θα μιλήσουμε σε αγγλικά, τα έχουμε γράψει για να μην γίνει και κανένα λάθο. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank you for coming here today to celebrate the 20 years of the Cocalis Foundation and more specifically the creation of the program for Southeastern and East Central Europe at Harvard Kennedy School of Government in 1998. Our vision at that time was uh, to help to the spread of democracy and prosperity through cooperation and good neighbor relations in the whole region of Southeastern Europe, including Turkey. We thought that supporting education opportunities in public administration and the promotion of the region with hundreds of high profile events in the world's top university was the best idea. The Cocalist program at Harvard supported about 100 degree students at the Kennedy School about 3,000 people participated in executive training programs, and many of them out to be very influential personalities today in their countries, and all of them made great use of their education and the network they built during their studies. In this journey, Professor Joseph Nye, a personality of enormous achievement in academic and public life in the United States, contributed his own vision. I remember that what interested him the most was that we were proposing to create a program for the whole region, not just for Greece. I went I want to thank him for his great leadership in helping establish the Cocalis program in 1998 as dean of the Kennedy School at the time and for all his support and friendship even since, ever since. I would also like to thank Holy Sargent, which was very helpful, and Joe McCarthy, who is today here with us, for their own persistent contribution to the success of the programs. Ladies and gentlemen, my personal conviction is that commitment to cooperation rather than antagonism is the only way for peace and prosperity, and that's what we need. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Kokalis. It is my great privilege and honor today to introduce on behalf of the Kokalis Foundation, Professor Joseph Nye. Dr. Nye has today the title of Harvard University Distinguished Service Professor Emeritus, which I believe is the highest distinction the university can offer to a member of its faculty. He's been member of the faculty at Harvard University since 1964. 
and has served as Dean of the Kennedy School of Government from 1995 until 2004. Professor Nye ranks as one of the most influential political scientists of our times due to his transformational thinking in the fields of international relations, the theories of power and leadership, from his earlier works on power and interdependence to his later and more known to us works on soft power and smart power. It is fair to say that his academic work and his public service have shaped much of the academic debate uh, of international relations and have left a permanent mark on US foreign policy. Today, he will speak to us on this celebration event about the future of the liberal international order. At the end of his speech, he is kind enough to take a few short questions from the audience. I would strongly urge you to prepare your questions, to keep it short, just one question, so we have time for many questions and more time for Professor Nye to address them. Professor Nye, the floor is yours. Thank you. I want to tell you what, uh, what a pleasure it is to be back in Athens, and particularly on the occasion of the 20th anniversary of the Coakley's program at the Kennedy School. I've been spending the last week uh, uh, teaching at Oxford University, and I was planning to go on to Israel, and when I learned about the 20th anniversary of this program being held this weekend, I said, Athens. <laughs> so, I want to pay tribute to uh, Socrates and Eleni and the Coakley's family and the foundation for creating a program which really was far-sighted in the sense of reaching out to, uh, as Socrates said, to the region as a whole. And I think that's a, a real accomplishment. So I, I'm here to say, if very slow. But it's about my one word of grief. But uh, I, my job tonight is to say to you a little bit about the future of the uh, international order, sometimes called the liberal international order. And it is not an easy task because we are living in a very strange time. If somebody had said that... Uh, uh, you are going to pick up your newspaper and read that the President of the United States rejected the communique of the Group of Seven because it talked about a, a rules-based system and then insult the uh, President, uh, the Prime Minister of Canada and then fly off to greet uh, the dictator of North Korea and call him a wonderful young man uh, would be surprising. Um, you wouldn't believe, I gave you this, the newspaper with a fake headline, you say, no, get me a better one than that. That's, that's just not plausible. Uh, but that's the world we're living in. So trying to tell you what is going to be the future of the international order is not easy. There have been a number of writers who proclaim that the liberal international order is over. If you read somebody like Martin Wolf in the Financial Times or Philip Stevens, very, very good uh, columnists, uh, they've been proclaiming the end of, of this uh, order. Uh, and they're usually, when people say that this post-1945 international system is over, uh, they usually attribute it to one of two causes. One is the rise of China, that the U.S. has declined, that China is going to pass the U.S., and that if you have an illiberal country, authoritarian country like China, it will impose a much more authoritarian international order. 
The other argument says, no, it's not going to be murder. It's going to be suicide. And it's not the rise of China. It's the rise of Trump. Because we've never seen a presidency like we've seen with Trump. And the actions that he's taking are the greatest threat. And that is what will end this international order. So let me speculate about both of those and try to give you my assessment, but confess in advance that nobody knows the answer. So what I will do is my best guess at, uh, at answers. Now if we start, uh, let's, before we go to whether the, what we mean by the rise of China and whether that's going to be determining or what we mean uh, or what does the rise of Trump mean, uh, let's go back and start at the beginning. When did the United States become the world's largest power? And if you think in economic terms, about 1900, the US becomes the world's largest economy at the beginning of the 20th century. But what's interesting is it doesn't use that position for the global balance of power. It's primarily oriented toward the Western Hemisphere, still following the tradition laid down by the first president, George Washington, who says, beware of entangling alliances. So the American attitude toward Europe and the global balance of power was keep your distance. Now, what's interesting is that changes in 1917 when Woodrow Wilson intervenes in World War I and tips the balance of power in favor of France and Britain instead of Germany. But the interesting thing is the Americans don't stay involved. They, Wilson tries to organize a League of Nations with a global system of collective security. The Senate rejects that and the Americans return home. The result is a very terrible decade in the 1930s because when the largest country does not produce global public goods, doesn't take leadership, uh, nobody does. And the great problem in the 1930s was Britain had become too weakened by World War I to play its traditional role. And the United States, which had become the strongest country, went home and uh, became a free rider. And the net effect of that was the 1930s were what the great British poet W.H. Auden has called a low dishonest decade. It produced a terrible depression, it produced genocide, and it produced World War II. So by 1945, the American leadership believed that they couldn't do this again, that at the end of World War II, they had to stay involved. And this became particularly true when you remember uh, Greece and Turkey were under threat from the Soviet Union. Uh, they had relied on help from Britain in the past, and the British told President Truman that Britain could no longer afford to provide security in the Eastern Mediterranean. Truman announced that he would step in, that's the so-called Truman Doctrine, in 1947. Uh, the following year, in 1948, you had the Marshall Plan to try to restore prosperity to Europe. Uh, in 1949, you had the NATO, the foundations of the alliance, which uh, remains to this day. In 1950, you had the US leading a coalition to repel North Koreans' crossing of the 38th parallel. Um, this was a very different role that the United States played after 45. And this has become known as the liberal international order or the American international order. So those are the origins of, of the system that we're talking about today. The key question, I think, is 
to what extent is it uh, going to decline or going to collapse because of the decline of the United States and the rise of China. Now, before we think about the word decline, I should tell you that it's a very confusing word. Uh, countries don't have natural life cycles like people do. I can assure you that if you look at me and look up my date of birth, I am in decline. There's absolutely no question about it. But is a country in decline? Is the United States in decline because it's had certain number of years of preeminence? And I should give you the example of Horace Walpole in the 18th century, a British statesman, after Britain lost its North American colonies, Walpole said, woe is Britain. We're now reduced to a miserable little island like Sardinia. Uh, that was on the eve of Britain's greatest century, which was fueled by the Industrial Revolution. So thinking that countries have a natural life cycle or that it's all over, uh, just doesn't work. What you have to uh, look at more carefully is are there indications of either absolute decline or relative decline? They're not the same thing. Absolute decline is what happened to ancient Rome. Uh, Rome didn't decline because of the rise of the Persian Empire or the German Empire or something. Uh, it declined because it was unable to defend itself from hordes of barbarians, and that was because it had no internal productivity in its economy, and it had internecine warfare. The Romans were spending their times fighting each other and not promoting economic growth, and the net result was absolute decline of Rome. Now, what's interesting is people often will like to write editorials about America, the United States, and say, it's like Rome. We're in that phase and the decline of the Roman Empire. This is the decline of the United States. But you know, it's not. There are certain long-term factors about the United States which would belie that vision of absolute decline. Let me give you a few. And these are long-term factors that are not affected by whether Trump is president or who's president. One is demographic. When you look at the United Nations projections of demography out to 2050, the middle of our century, they show that the largest country today is China, but in 2050 it's going to be India. And the ranking of countries will be in 2050, India, China, the United States. And what's interesting is today is China, India, the United States. But the United States is the only major country which is keeping its ranking. In other words, if you look at the problems of dependency ratios, in other words, the number of people who are in the productive labor force versus dependent on assistance from those who are working, the United States is going to be doing okay. And that's a contrast with Russia, which is in severe demographic decline, Japan in demographic decline, and alas, Europe, which is also suffering demographic decline. So if you say the long run of the United States, you have to realize that in demographic terms, the country's better placed than most others. The second thing that we might look at would be energy. If we were here uh, 10 years ago on the 10th anniversary of the Coquilis Fellowships, uh, we would have said the American energy situation is quite hopeless, increasingly dependent upon Middle Eastern oil. And how can you be a great power when you're subject to extortion by 
uh, people who are owning the oil wells in the Persian Gulf. And today, it's very different. If you look at the shale revolution, it has created a situation where the application of technologies, hydraulic fracturing and horizontal drilling to shale rock, which has been there all the time, has made North America likely to be independent of energy imports in the, in the 2020s. That's a huge change at the same time that China will become increasingly dependent on Middle Eastern oil. A third thing you might look at about what's the long-term situation, if whether the United States is in absolute decline, would be the indicators of technology at science and technology, we ask what are the major technologies that are going to be dominating this 21st century? Mostly people would say biotechnology, nanotechnology, and the next generation of information technology, particularly artificial intelligence and big data. And if you ask what country is ahead in all three, it's the United States. And if you say, well, but can they sustain it? Do they have the intellectual structure? Well, if you look at the rankings of universities by Shanghai Jiao Tong University, which does an annual ranking of universities, they say of the 20 most important universities in the world today, 15 of the 20 are in the United States. None are in China. So the view that the United States is in absolute decline, like ancient Rome, just is not uh, a very good description of the situation. But a country can be in doing pretty well in absolute terms, but suffer relative decline. In other words, if I'm doing okay, but somebody else is doing much better, then I could be in relative decline. And in that case, one has to ask, who could replace the US? In that sense, the candidates are obvious. One uh, is Russia, but as I mentioned, I think Russia is actually in decline. Not only is there demographic decline that I mentioned, but they're an energy economy which has not been able to adapt to the problems of developing an information economy. And so two-thirds of Russian exports are basically oil and gas. Another possible contender to replace the United States would be Europe. Europe has the same size of economy, the same level of talent, but it lacks unity. And if Europe could pull itself together, it would be equivalent, but it that type of unity he seems lacking at this time. Another possible contender would be India, which as I mentioned will be the most populous country in the world in 2050. But India is still very much a developing country and it's an economy with about a $2 trillion economy compared to the US $20 trillion economy. And the big problem for the Indians is that they're wasting a huge amount of their human resources. One third of Indian women are illiterate. That's a huge amount of your human capital to not uh, use. So India has, with its current 7% growth rate, an, a bright future, but it also has some major problems that it has to overcome. So we're brought back to this question of China, which is what is the potential contender that might mean the US is in relative decline? And that would be China. Now, the question of China compared to the US in size is somewhat contentious. The International Monetary Fund did a study a few years ago saying that if you use a measure called purchasing power parity, where you measure the welfare of countries that China is already larger than the US. The trouble with using that measure is if I'm importing oil or jet engines, 
I don't pay for it with purchasing power parity. I pay for it with dollars or renminbi. And if you measure at the exchange rate, China is a $12 billion economy, and as I mentioned, the US is a $20 billion economy. But with a high growth rate, which China has, now at about 6.5%, uh, at some point it may be larger than the US in total size. The question is, does that mean that the order will change and that China will dominate? And I think the answer to that is probably no. I think the prospects of China replacing the US in any short term are limited because power has several dimensions. It's not just the size of your gross domestic product. It's also military power, where the US is has a military budget of about four times that of China. It's also soft power, your ability to get what you want through attraction and various efforts to measure and study soft power. There's an index that's published in London on this, uh, which puts the Americans at number three and China, I think, at number 26. So China is not about to pass the US in overall power. Now, why should we think about that? And the answer is because many people say that the problem of China and the US is going to be that we will fall into what a colleague of mine has called the Thucydides trap, named, of course, for a very famous Greek who worked down the road a ways. And uh, the idea, if you remember, was Thucydides said that the Peloponnesian War was caused by the rise in the power of Athens and the fear it created in Sparta. And many people have said that World War I, in which Europe tore itself apart and stopped being the center of the global balance of power, was caused by the rise of the power of Germany and the fear that created in Britain. And so this same train of thought says that the rise of China will create fear in the United States, which will lead to a war which will totally disrupt our century. I don't think that's true. And one of the reasons it's not true is if you look at 1914 and the origins of World War I, it's worth remembering that Germany had already passed Britain in industrial power 14 years before the war started. Whereas if the numbers which I just suggested to you are correct, China is not about to pass the US. It'll get close, but it's not going to pass the US. And if that's the case, then we don't have to be so fearful that we let this system break down. The question will be how do we incorporate China in it rather than how do we let it break apart into war. Um, so in that view, uh, will this order succumb to the rise of China? Uh, I tend to be skeptical that that will be the cause. There is a, uh, uh, a statement that uh, Lee Kuan Yew once told me, or position that he had describing this. I used to serve on a international board with him, and we used to discuss this, uh, Lee Kuan Yew being the former prime minister of Singapore and a very shrewd observer of both the United States and China. And I said, do you think that China is going to pass the US in the first half of the 20th century? He said, no, they're gonna get close. They're gonna give you a run for your money, but they're not gonna pass you because China can draw on the talents of 1.3 billion people, but the US draws on the talents of 7.5 billion people, and then it recombines them with a diversity which is much better for creativity than ethnic Han nationalism. Lee Kuan Yew, of course, was ethnic Han. So I think my view about will this order succumb to the rise of China is probably not. We're gonna have to adapt to Chinese power, but I don't see this breaking down. So if it's not going to be the rise of China, let me take you back 
to my other hypothesis, which is that it will be the rise of Trump. And this is what my friend, the Singapore diplomat, Kishore Mabubani, has said, which he said, it's not that China is going to murder this order, it's the Americans are gonna commit suicide. And the suicide of the order is gonna be caused by the policies of Donald Trump. Now, Donald Trump is a very different type of president that we've had before. Uh, there is a colleague of mine at Harvard Business School uh, who has written a book in which he says, American presidents have, are either filtered or unfiltered. Uh, it's not coffee we're talking about. We're talking about the political system. He said some presidents come up through the parties. People know them well. You know what you're getting. Other presidents in the American system come out of nowhere, uh, suddenly erupting and taking over. And he said what that does is it means in the American political system, when you have an unfiltered candidate, you can get a much broader range of potential qualifications in success or failure. You may get somebody who's a lot better or a lot worse. And he points out that Abraham Lincoln was largely an unfiltered president. He had been a congressman for two years and he worked on this new party which was then uh, the Republican Party. Uh, and yet Lincoln became one of our greatest presidents. Donald Trump is also unfiltered. He had no experience in politics, had worked in real estate and in reality TV, and actually became president because of an oddity of our constitutional system. He didn't win the majority of votes. He won the majority of electoral votes, so he got enough votes in the right states to become president and was accepted as legitimate president uh, because that's what the Constitution says. Uh, but it, the behavior of Donald Trump has been very, very different from prior presidents. The United States has had difficult presidents, indeed uh, presidents who uh, 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 were almost uh, uh, impeached in the past. Uh, Richard Nixon is a good example. But Nixon was a, was a very clear-headed man. He, he knew where he wanted to go. He developed long-run strategies and so forth. Uh, Trump is very different. He has a short attention span, and he filters things through his own ego as to how he responds to things, and has very little experience of international affairs. And this is what produces things like the way I started my talk, that what I thought would be an imaginary headline from last week, but which was real, an American president rejecting the communique of the group of seven, insulting his Canadian host, and praising a Korean dictator. Uh, that is different from other presidents' behavior. Why? Does he do this? What's his formation? This is not an unintelligent man. In fact, he's very smart and very shrewd. But I think to understand him, you have to understand not only the background in New York real estate, but also his background in reality TV. And in reality TV, the secret of success is to keep the camera focused on you all the time. And how do you keep the camera focused on you all the time? By being outrageous. And when people start saying, what you just said is outrageous, it's a lie, you can't. By the time they have gone to the newspapers and checked the facts and are proving that you're wrong, you go to the next outrage. And when they're checking those facts, you go to the next outrage. And that's the function of Twitter for Trump. He uses Twitter to dominate the agenda. And it's very clever. It's a little bit like, you know, if you have a dog that keeps coming and barking at your leg, you throw a bone, the dog runs away. And before the dog comes back, you throw another bone and another bone. And this is what Trump is able to do with the press and with the American political agenda. And that is not a stupid man. That is the first president in the age of social media 
who's learned how to control the agenda. And I think the interesting question is what will be the effect of this on the international order? Some people say that it will be a disaster. And what we saw at the G7 meeting in Quebec last week is an illustration that it will break American alliances, that withdrawal from the Iran agreement and getting, turning a dispute between the United States and Iran into a dispute between the United States and Europe about companies investing in Iran, that this is going to be the destruction of the order. There are other people who say, look, that's the conventional wisdom of people like me. And that, in fact, it may well be that because Trump breaks conventional wisdom and does things that are outrageous, he may pull off very large successes, which others aren't able to do. So my uh, former colleague, Neil Ferguson, uh, wrote in last Sunday's uh, uh, Times of London that uh, Trump might pull off something really big. Um, and if, for example, he were able to create peace on the Korean Peninsula by having real denuclearization, or if he were able to produce major change in Iran, or if he were able to uh, make China change its behavior in terms of compulsory transfer of technology in the trading system or something. Like that. These are big issues. And maybe by being outrageous, he'll be able to do what others haven't been able to do. I suspect that's not likely. But we have to leave our minds open to the possibility that an unfiltered president doing things that are very different may accomplish things that are very unlikely. The problem, however, is that there's a high cost associated with this. And this was pointed out in the London Economist in the issue last week. I don't know if any of you saw it. It had Trump hanging from a wrecking ball, you know, the type of thing you swing into buildings to break them down. And then when you look closely, the wrecking ball is the planet, Earth. And what the economist argued that is that even if Trump were to get a big success along one of the lines that Neil Ferguson was talking about, by destroying the institutions that help countries work together, we're not going to be able to cope with the big problems that we face in the future. Many of the problems we face in the future will require us to understand power with others rather than power over others. Take climate change, for example. There's no way the United States can deal with the problem of climate change alone. There's no way China can deal with it alone or Europe can deal with it alone. The only way to have success on dealing with climate change, which is a very real problem, my science friends tell me, is to essentially work with others. And there are gonna be more issues like this. Pandemics, issues related to global terrorism, rules of the road for cyber, and so forth. And by turning his back on a rules-based order and multilateralism and weakening our alliances, Trump is weakening our capacity to deal with this set of issues. So perhaps he would get a grand agreement on denuclearization of Korea. I can tell you in questions and answers why I think it's unlikely, but let's grant that he does. In the meantime, if he's broken the institutions that we're gonna need to organize networks to work with us, others, then we're gonna be all the worse off for it. So I think the big problem that we face in terms of dealing with this rules-based international order or open international order or liberal international order is really not so much the rise of China. I think a key question there is can we accommodate China to work with us on issues like climate or cyber and so forth. The question is whether we will develop attitudes at home 
able to form those networks to maintain those alliances. And that's where I think we see the greatest danger to the liberal international order. And why I fear that Kishore Mabubani may be right, that the danger of suicide is greater than the danger of murder. I personally uh, am mildly optimistic that this won't happen, but I say only mildly. If Trump is a four-year president, I think we will recover from this. If he's an eight-year president, I'm not so sure. Now, when I say this, people say, well, what are the odds? And I say, well, I've told you what I think is likely, but you shouldn't ask me about the odds. You should ask me about the size of the bet I would make. I'll bet you 10 euros, not 10,000 euros. So we are indeed living in an era of considerable uncertainty. I retain a degree of residual optimism, but uh, this time is very different from anything we've seen in the past. So my message for you is that uh, stay tuned, that uh, when I come back for the 30th anniversary of the Cochalis uh, Fellowships, maybe we'll have the answer. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor Nye. It's always fascinating to listen to you. And the task of moderating a panel with you is uh, high enough. Now I have to moderate this wonderful audience. Um, if we were at the Kennedy School, people would be lining up behind microphones, standing microphones on the floor. We're still rule-based here, so the mic will, will be delivered to you. you. We will ask you only to state your name and affiliation and ask a short question, just one question that ends with a question mark. So, Mrs. Xafa. Thank you. Uh, my affiliation is uh, it's a Canadian think tank, the Center for International Governance Innovation. My question is the following. If uh, President Trump manages to convince China to open up its market uh, by imposing tariffs initially, would you then agree with your former colleague uh, Ferguson that perhaps uh, there is a, a sort of way of achieving things that is not the way we are used to. Thank you. Very interesting question. Well, the interesting question is there are two parts to it. One is will he succeed in changing China's behavior? And the second is is the cost or the benefit greater? Uh, will he succeed? I suspect what you're going to get is a cosmetic solution. I don't think Xi Jinping is going to give up his plan to have certain things, high-tech things, made in China by 2025, which has involved coercive technology transfer. And he's also, Xi has also announced that China will lead the world in artificial intelligence in 2030. Uh, with those goals, it seems unlikely that the demands that the United States is making in relation to China's changing its policy on subsidies and tech transfer are unlikely to succeed. But Trump will need a victory, and what he'll do is focus on the bilateral balance of trade. And that's easy to get a cosmetic victory. What you do is you have the Chinese buy a lot of soybeans and get natural gas from the United States. It doesn't solve much because a bilateral trade deficit is not the key uh, 
to the success economically in a multilateral world, but it allows Trump then to parade before the American people and say, look, I got a $50 billion improvement in the bilateral trade relationship. So that'll be cosmetic rather than real. Um, so that's, I think, the likely outcome. But suppose, let's grant the point that suppose he does get China to really change its policies in terms of intellectual property. Um, would that be worth the fact that he will in the process have destroyed the World Trade Organization? When you use Article 232 of the World Trade Organization, which is national defense or national security, to put tariffs against Canada, then anybody can, for any reason, put tariffs and call it national security. The, the Canadian threat is not that great, even, even with CG. And uh, so I think, uh, I doubt that he's gonna succeed, but if he does, I think the damage to the institutions is a higher price than, than it's worth. But I may be wrong. Thank you. Next question, Tessa. Hi, Tessa Betulahu from uh, the International Risk Governance Center at EPFL in Lausanne, also formerly a student of Tom Birstecker, who sends his regards. I want to ask a question, I don't want to ask about Trump, but I want to ask a question about what's happening to democratic politics, because historically one could argue that the appeal of the international liberal order or liberal politics has been that you could grow power, including economic, technology, etc., while protecting or potentially growing political freedoms, democracy in particular. It seems like we might be living in uncertain times where this is maybe not happening in the sense that there's vying for power and so forth, but what might be risk is that we might let a little bit of political freedom, democratic politics, we might let it go. Is this happening? Should be, we be worried about it in the case of the United States? And if so, what are the political institutions or maybe intuitions that would help us live with that? Well, we don't know the answer to th this question about the future of democracy. Uh, I think that despite the problems that we're seeing uh, in the American political system now, that the constitutional system of checks and balances uh, is probably going to survive this. Um, we have seen in the United States periods that are even worse. Remember in 1968, uh, we had a situation where two major assassinations occurred Kennedy and Martin Luther King, Robert Kennedy, Martin Luther King, and there were cities set on fire. The Democratic National Convention was disrupted by riots. Um, a few years after that, uh, my building at Harvard uh, was bombed. Um, we haven't seen that kind of disruption in the U.S. democracy at this stage, but we do see uh, countries like Hungary where Orban has declared uh, illiberal democracy. And there is a worry that that might spread. Some people say that China and Russia will together create an authoritarian front. Uh, I think that's a bit exaggerated because China and Russia still have very different, deeper interests. But China's authoritarianism is, is increasing not decreasing. There was a theory in the 90s that with economic growth, China would not become a democracy, but at least would liberalize. And things have been moving in just the opposite direction. So uh, there are real problems in terms of democracy, um, but I think it varies by country. And I worry a little bit about generalizations that compare us to the 1930s, where there was a very real feeling that democracy was retreat around the world, that uh, communism and fascism were taking over. Uh, I don't think we're in that situation, but we do have to spend more time asking, why is it that you have some of the problems that we're having in our democracies? And uh, a lot of people are thinking about that, 
I don't think anybody found any one answer. Thank you, Professor Nye. Do I see another question in the back? Hello, Dimitri Simomitz from Eurobank Global Markets. Uh, to what extent, we're trying to convince ourselves that Donald Trump is a non-conventional president, but I find many similarities with Madman's theory from Richard Nixon, and the way he emphatically negotiates constantly reminds me uh, Richard Nixon's uh, Madman's theory, although I wasn't alive at the time, from, from what I have read. I want you, I would like you to tell me whether you think this is true, and I would like you to tell me whether you think uh, there is a basis uh, why Trump is imposing all these levies and uh, import taxes, because when Obama took over the office, the U.S. debt stood at $9 trillion. Today, it stands at $20 trillion. And I think that this, there is no debt sustainability in the medium term for the U.S. debt. Thank you very much. Well, the uh, Nixon approach to bargaining was uh, what you call the madman theory, was to be able to pretend that you would do something crazy. And that obviously can improve your bargaining power. In other words, if your opponent thinks that you are uh, possibly going to do something crazy, uh, you may give in. Uh, one of my colleagues at Harvard, Tom Schelling, who is an economist who did some very basic work on game theory and bargaining, used to say, if you're playing a game of chicken in which two cars are approaching each other, and uh, you know the, whoever swerves first loses, and you're trying to convince the other person that you will not swerve, you can take the steering wheel off and hang it out the window, hold it out the window. You're probably gonna get the other guy to swerve. And that was the madman theory. Now, you could also have a fake steering wheel, a second one, which you hang out the window and so forth. So there are ways to game the game. But, the, but that, so in that sense, uh, Trump's approach, which is bluster, insult, seem like a madman, has a tradition in bargaining theory. The problem is it also has a cost. And uh, I think that, as I said earlier, that the cost will probably exceed the benefit. I don't think he's going to be able to pull something off. Uh, remember, Nixon, for all his madman theory, Nixon had a long-term strategy which changed our policy toward China. Now, Trump may think that he's doing the same thing with North Korea. I don't think so, but we'll see. But that's the, that's the analogy, and there is some theory behind the analogy. Um, but I, I don't think that there's a strategy. Nixon had a strategy. I don't see the strategy with Trump. And on the economy, uh, Trump's feeling was that uh, if you pass this tax bill and you don't worry about the deficit, the economic growth will be so great that it will take care of the deficit in the future. There is not much evidence to support that. Uh, so I think uh, I, I remain skeptical on both the, those points. Mrs. Tavella. My name is Niki Tavella. I'm a former member of the European Parliament. Up till the G7 summit, Brussels was preparing legislation to prevent Chinese investment in Europe. And it was almost ready. A lot of direct directives came out, you know, trying to make it hard for China to invest in Europe. The day that we had the, D7, uh, the G7 summit, the following day, it was the Europe-China summit. And there was quite an opening from Europe to China. Do you see that this coalition may have a future? How do you see that going? 
Well, China is using its uh, economic strength um, and trade uh, both for its own economic growth and benefit, which is fine, that's a good thing, but it also uses it for politics. And uh, so Chinese investment in Europe, uh, which is market oriented, is a good thing. But some Chinese investment is not so much interested in markets as in political influence. And I think that's where Europe is going to have to be very careful. Uh, there, if you look at the case of Sri Lanka, where the Chinese gave loans to the Sri Lankan government uh, for projects to build an airport and a port, which turned out not to have much basis in market economics. And they were unsuccessful. And the Sri Lankans then couldn't pay the loans back. And so the Chinese converted the loans into 99-year leases, meaning China owned these parts of Sri Lanka. If the Americans or British had done that 100 years ago, we would have called it colonialism. And the point is that China do it does some things for market reasons and does them well. And to the extent to which Chinese investment has a good market basis, uh, good. But not all of the investments are based on market considerations. Another question here. And I hope we can get some questions that will end up with an optimistic view. <laughs> okay, maybe that might be it. My name is Konstantinos Macheras from Organization Earth. Professor, you referred to um, Mr. Trump as uh, an unfiltered president. And what do you think of the argument that that, that might be an unprecedented opportunity uh, for people to react as it seems that he holds no bar? Uh, what about the argument that uh, previous presidents because of the huge charisma, like Obama, were easily forgiven for not actually changing the status quo. Thank you. Well, that's it. that would be the argument that um, having an unconventional president who doesn't follow normal rules of behavior uh, may produce something much more extraordinary. And um, uh, I think, I mean, that's a... Uh, you can't rule that out in advance. You have to wait for history to see whether that's true or not. But again, if you ask me to make a bet on it, I would. I, if the man had a strategy and there was a plan there, uh, I'd be more confident. I don't see that. Uh, I don't think that that's going to be successful. But you know, it's a. But it certainly is an, a possibility that as one has to keep an open mind about. Okay, we had one question in the back. Hello, I'm Herda Jaffer. I, I graduated from the college last May. And I have been born and raised in Albania and we've always been taught to look up to US institutions. And now I'm left wondering what power will these institutions have, these well-established institutions such as the Congress or the Senate, in either shaping the Trump presidency if it does continue or putting an end to it before it has an eight-year um, term. Thank you. Well, the, the US Constitution um, as written in uh, the 18th century was designed to be inefficient. Uh, it was designed to preserve liberty. So rather than centralize power and civilize it, the US pattern was to disperse power and to create checks and balances. That means it's very hard to get anything done. But that was deliberately designed that way. And um, so we're seeing frustration about the sense of gridlock and paralysis, but we're also seeing that it's hard for Trump to impose his will as a result. So there's a plus and a minus to the design of the US Constitution. Uh, I think what strikes me is that 
these institutions which were developed in the 18th century have proved pr surprisingly resilient. I mean, if you look at the, um, the court system, it's very uh, independent and very highly respected. Um, you know, in, in if you look at the role of the press, under freedom of the press, the First Amendment, the press has stood up to uh, very harsh attacks. And even some of the um, some of the unwritten rules of the Constitution, uh, such as trying to make the Justice Department less political, uh, that has held up so far. The big question is what's going to happen when Robert Mueller uh, concludes his investigation, and will Trump abide by it or not? And then you might have a crisis in which you'll have to see whether the uh, Senate and the Congress and the courts uh, stand up to, uh, to, if Trump resists it, stand up to him. But so far, I think there's been more resilience of these, what some people call outdated institutions. Well, maybe the old founding fathers weren't so foolish after all. Maybe by creating this system of checks and balances, they made an inefficient government, but it's made it hard for anybody to take over. I don't think you could, I mean, if you look at Hungary and what Orban has done to the courts and what he's done to uh, control of, uh, of the press and so forth, um, uh, that, that's a very different situation than what we're seeing in, in the United States. Dimitri. Thank you. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I was reminded this morning uh, by Chris that last time you were here, back in 2000, there was a demonstration in Syndagma Square against the abolition of religious affiliation in Greek IDs. And since there is another demonstration uh, today um, coming from a similar part of uh, society against the forthcoming agreement with uh, uh, former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia. I wanted to ask you about this uh, anti-liberal, anti-elitist uh, backlash that we see all over the world, especially in the States and of course in Europe. Um, you come from Harvard. You par excellence are the very symbol of this elitism. What is the criticism you would offer um, uh, to, to, to the elitists um, and to the fact that uh, uh, calling the deplorables deplorables is not the right answer to the problem of uh, populism and there must be some in between way. Mm -hmm. Well, populism uh, is basically defined as anti-elitism and you can have populism of the left or populism of the right. Uh, in American history, we had populist movements uh, which uh, were led by people from the left in the late 1890s, which paved the way for the progressive movements and reforms that were carried out by Teddy Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson. Uh, so it was, very, uh, it was very healthy for democracy to have that populism. There's another populism of the right, though, that plays on what you were talking about, Dimitri, which is a uh, cultural identity, and uh, which is an easy uh, way to rally people against other people. And you saw this with uh, uh, people like Senator Joe McCarthy or Governor George Wallace, uh, and this is basically the populism that Trump has tapped into. And it's interesting that the issue of migration has been a major issue, and the facts don't seem to matter much. In 2016, the net flow of Mexicans was out of the US back to Mexico, but Trump raised this question constantly of build a wall and keep the Mexicans out. Didn't have to do with facts, it had to do with the symbolism of right-wing populism. Uh, 
And I think elites who had not paid enough attention to the way immigration was affecting popular attitudes fell victim to that. And I think that happened also in Britain with Brexit. Uh, I think it happened in Germany with the rise of, of uh, AFD. Um, and so in that sense, the elites, I don't think were paying enough attention to the issues which were driving many of the people who eventually voted for Trump. That doesn't mean one has to approve of their positions, but it means we didn't do a very good job of understanding them. And I think that's a lesson which has been learned. Along with that has been the feeling that um, there was not enough attention being paid to uh, inequality and the economic effects of globalization. Uh, those are now the, the conventional wisdom that elites have to pay more attention to immigration and to economic inequality. Whether that will be sufficient to defuse those uh, issues in 2020, we don't know. We have time for one more question, if there is one. There is a woman over here. Oh, please. Given the countries uh, have a natural life cycle, as you said, uh, what happened with Europe? Because uh, I'm afraid that apart, you said that Europe lack, lacks unity, but uh, I'm afraid that apart from that, uh, European political system is uh, somehow obsolete and old fashioned. So to what extent do you think that Europe is in decline? Thank you. Well, I, I think if one takes a long perspective, uh, Europe's not doing nearly as badly as Europeans think. Uh, if you look back, let's say, to the Treaty of Rome, not Maastricht, but let's go back further, and you uh, then look at the cycles of opinion in Europe, there's almost a cyclical uh, Euro-optimism and Euro-pessimism. You know, and right now we're on a downside of a cycle of Euro pessimism. Uh, Brexit has helped to trigger it, but the reactions to the uh, economic crisis of 2009, there are lots of, uh, the migration crisis, lots of things that are, that are difficult. But think back of the Europe at the time of the Treaty of Rome, and remember that France and Germany had fought each other three times in 70 years and brought total destruction. And today, nobody would imagine anything in which you'd see that kind of fighting between European countries. This is an extraordinary accomplishment. The trouble is, it's been so good we've forgotten it. And another example would be the fact that you have created a single market. Now, there are imperfections in the single market, but it's also a very powerful market. And so much so that there's some areas where Europe is the world leader. For example, on the issues of privacy and antitrust, which the big internet companies are now having to cope with, they want access to the European market. And that's why you find that Europe is able to set the rules and the American companies and other companies are going to have to live by those rules. So it, the, you know, the fact that you've created a huge zone of peace, that you've created a market of great significance which can have weight in the international world, and that you have some areas where uh, Europe has taken a lead on uh, let's take climate change, ecological issues, uh, where, uh, I mean, it took a number of countries to work on it, but you have to give credit to uh, uh, Europe uh, for the efforts that went into Paris in 2015. So I, I, I think right now 
uh, Europe is going through a bad spell of Euro pessimism. And it's made worse by Brexit, having just come from ten, you know, a week or so in, in uh, Britain and hearing people fight about whether Britain should uh, become a big Norway or not. I mean, there's, you know, it's, it's kind of ridiculous in some ways. But I, I find that uh, it, I think if you take a long run perspective, you'll see that Europe has not done so bad, so rather badly. So rather than end on a note of pessimism, I would uh, say that Europe, uh, while it has troubles now, um, I would be more optimistic. The other thing is, it's true that uh, both Vladimir Putin and Donald Trump are not fans of Europe. Uh, both of them would like to weaken Europe in their own ways. Trump doesn't like multilateralism. Putin doesn't like the competition. But uh, if you think about it from the American point of view, there are a large number of people in uh, the permanent civil service, in the Defense Department, the, the uh, State Department, so forth, a lot of people in the Congress, including staff as well as elected members, who really are very pro-Europe. So while Trump could campaign on the theory that NATO was obsolete, um, it took him about four months before he realized that he wasn't going to get that through with his own supporters in his own administration, like General Mattis. And so I, th I think in that sense, the European-American relationship, while it looks very bad, as the story I told to begin my talk uh, illustrated, it may not be as bad as it looks if we are talking about a four-year Trump presidency. Another way of thinking about this is that for the large issues that the Americans face and others, there are no two parts of the world which share more common values than Europe and the United States. The Euro Americans can't do these things alone, and they're going to need more working with Europe. So I would end not on a note of pessimism about Europe, but say we're going to need more European leadership and more working with Europe, and Europe ought to be a little bit more confident in what is actually accomplished over the long run. I promised you that we were going to end on a rather optimistic note. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you for coming here tonight, in particular the fellows who have traveled from their countries to have a wonderful session this morning and attend the keynote event with Professor Nye. And of course, thank Professor Nye once more for a fascinating talk and for helping us navigate all these years and succeed in making the program a success at Harvard. Thank you. Well, thank you. <laughs>